So I know you don't want to get into any of the private conversations that you've had with the president, uh, generally, but generally speaking, how prepared do you think uh, President Biden is for this meeting tomorrow? Oh, I think he's pretty prepared uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, he has been doing a lot of briefing and sessions with outsiders as well as his own team. And isn't that the right thing? <laughs> Don't we like that for presidents to prepare? Okay. I think that's a <laughs> admirable quality. By the way, a mix of Democrats and Republicans in these meetings. Uh, number two, remember, President Biden has been doing national security and foreign policy for decades. Uh, so he's not new to these kinds of summits. Um, and number three, I did brief him actually before his last meeting with then Prime Minister Putin. I was on that trip with him to Moscow in 2011. And I can tell you, we spent hours and hours before then because he knew and understood then that you have to be prepared for a meeting with Putin. I'm sure that he'll be prepared for this meeting tomorrow. So in your view, what is the number one issue on the president's mind right now? Is it Alexei Navalny? Is it arms control? Is it a potential prisoner swap? What's the top issue that he wants to address in this meeting? Well, I hope he doesn't have just a top issue, or I hope he has several, and you just very smartly brought together what I think needs to be together in this summit, which is human rights and things we care about on that front and arms control. Because there are some that say you have to do one or the other. And to get a, an agreement to have strategic stability talks, that's the phrase they use to talk about uh, a new round of negotiations about reducing and controlling nuclear weapons, you have to not talk about Alexei Navalny. And I radically disagree with that. I think you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can bring up both those sets of issues. And maybe you won't have progress in terms of releasing Mr. Navalny or the two Americans that are held wrongly, in my view, in Moscow today, but at least you raise the issue and you remind Putin that we're paying attention. If there's one issue that I think there will be, could be progress on, I should say could, one is to begin this process of negotiating about uh, how to control nuclear weapons after the new START treaty expires. It expires in five years, but you might think that's a long time, but it's not in arms control negotiations. And number two, I would hope that there would be some restoration of our diplomatic presence in Moscow and their diplomatic presence in Washington. Right now, our ambassadors are at home. One's in Washington and one's in Moscow. Actually, both of them are here tonight in Geneva. Uh, but just mm -hmm. a few days ago, they were back home. That would be a small step towards what I think is important diplomatic channels of communication. That does sound like something that's tangible. Um, to come out of the meeting. And you've been in meetings with Vladimir Putin. Uh, I don't have that experience. So uh, I'm, I, as with, the, with you here, what's he like? What's he like in person? How does he try to get the upper hand? Is he like, is he a poker player? Does he have the perfect poker face, chess player? What is he like in, in the room? Well, a couple of things. I mean, one, he's very prepared too, by the way. Uh, the first summit meeting I was in with him was with President Obama back in July 2009. Uh, and I was struck by the level of detail that he talked about issues and talked about our side and our government. So you have to be prepared with the details. Number two, he loves to stare. He has these deep blue eyes. He likes to look at you, uh, keep his attention on you. I don't know if you can see me, Zerlina. I'm doing it to the camera right now. And it makes you a little uncomfortable. <laughs> um, uh, and number three, yeah. and number three, he's not, a pr he's not afraid to surprise you with some kind of crazy idea. Uh, he most certainly did that uh, to President Trump in Helsinki in 2018 when he brought up the crazy idea that we should swap in derogation of their uh, indicted Russian intelligence officers, that is people that Mr. Mueller had indicted for interfering in our elections in two 2016. And he proposed, well, we would like to interrogate some American officials. And for me, that became personal because I was one of those people on his list. And President Trump was not prepared to respond to that in an effective way. Even when he met with Vice President Biden a decade ago, he did something similar. He said at the end of the meeting in front of all the cameras, 
we've just agreed to visa-free travel between our two countries. Isn't that great? And then he sat back and he waited for the vice president to respond. So you need to be uh, ready for those kinds of antics as well. Well, it seems like it's a lot to deal with uh, those piercing blue eyes. I mean, anybody staring deeply at me, that's going to make me <laughs> physically uncomfortable. Uh, this is the first meeting between the two leaders too, since Biden me. took over. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, this is the first meeting since, since Biden took over the Oval Office. Do you think we're putting too much weight on just one meeting this early on in an administration? Or... Um, you know, is it momentous? Is this a moment where you have somebody experienced like Biden going in and he can come out with some tangible results? It's a great question. I don't have a great answer. Uh, I'd say two things, thinking about what I've learned talking to White House officials in the government. Uh, number one, they believe that you should have dialogue even with your adversaries, and I agree with that. You need to talk to Putin. Uh, whether it needs to be a summit, a standalone meeting like this, that's a different issue, but you should talk. But number two, the main reason they're talking to Putin now is they're trying to, to, if you will, get ahead of history and so that there aren't further crises down the road because their main agenda, as you know well, is on the domestic side. Uh, President Biden has a giant domestic agenda. You were just talking about it before coming to me. And he doesn't want to be distracted with crises created by Vladimir Putin. And so I think that's part of their strategy. Engage with them now so that we don't have to deal with strat uh, kinds of crises uh, down the future. How do you expect this relationship between these two leaders to progress over the course of Biden's term? A lot can happen, we've learned, in the past four and eight years uh, when it comes to Russia. Well, I hope they have a regular dialogue. Uh, I don't think they need a summit every year, but, you know, on the sidelines of other multilateral meetings, they should meet on occasion uh, and I, they should call each other. Uh, but I don't think the president should try to befriend Vladimir Putin. Uh, I actually don't think it's a good idea to have a normalized relationship with a leader that annexes territory of his neighbor, that props up dictators like Mr. Assad in Syria, that violates our sovereignty, as he did in our 2016 presidential election most audaciously, but again in 2020, and even tries to assassinate uh, Russians, exiled Russians living in NATO countries. I, I don't think we should aspire to a normal relationship with that kind of leader. At the same time, when we can cooperate on a small agenda that's in America's national interest, President Biden should do so. That's easy to say, it's hard to do, but I think that's the agenda moving forward for the next four years. It feels like in this moment, Ambassador, that you know, coming on the heels of Donald Trump, there may have been damage done in terms of uh, America's standing in the world, certainly, but also when it comes to Russia, because Trump was so uh, defensive of Russia and Vladimir Putin specifically. I'm thinking about Helsinki. So in your view, how much damage was done, which is sort of the foundation for Biden going into this meeting um, with all that damage at his feet that he has to repair? I think a lot of damage was done uh, across uh, the world with uh, bilateral relationships, our participation in multilateral institutions, um, and Biden's got a lot of cleanup. Uh, now, I think he's had a great trip so far in that cleanup. I thought it was really wise to meet with our democratic allies first, right? G7, uh, NATO, European Union. Uh, and, and remind the world that we are back. We're engaged with our democratic allies. By the way, allies is one of our greatest strengths when dealing with Russia or China. They don't have, have any real allies to speak of. That's a great symbolic thing to do. And I think they had some very tangible um, progress in those meetings and then end it with this meeting with Vladimir Putin. But you're exactly right. Uh, President Trump actually didn't do much in his relationship with Russia and Vladimir Putin. For four years, he kept talking about what a great guy Putin was and wanted friendly ties and went out of his way to signal that. His own administration, however, did not. They had two policies towards Russia, not one. And as a result, there was no tangible achievements. I can't think of one single major positive thing 
that Mr. Trump got done with Putin that advanced the interests of the American people uh, in four years, I hope that President Biden will change that course and do things that are good for Americans and not just good for a friendly, chummy, personal relationship with Vladimir Putin. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be like an important priority when the country we're talking about is the one who keeps hacking us, hacking our infrastructure, hacking uh, our election. Uh, last question. Vladimir Putin, uh, turns out he's not very uh, timely. Turns out uh, the rumor is he's late for <laughs> meetings. Do you think he's going to make Biden wait? Well, he's notoriously late. Uh, many meetings I participated in, he was several hours late for lower level officials. And in one meeting in Los Cabos, Mexico in 2012, he was 40 minutes late to meet with President uh, Obama. Now, Zerlina, I got a great photo out of that meeting because Obama and I just uh, <laughs> talked for a long time because I'd left the White House and I was back from Moscow and we caught up on our kids' basketball teams. Uh, and, and President Obama, that does, those kind of gamemanship didn't matter to him. Uh, but I think they've done something very clever tomorrow. Uh, uh, if you look at the schedule, President Putin is scheduled to arrive first, meet with the president of Switzerland, shake his hand, and then go into the bi bilateral meeting. Then President Biden gets to show up second, so that if Putin is late, uh, President Biden will not be just chilling there, waiting for him uh, anxiously. That's a that's chalk that up as a win for the protocol team for the Biden team. That I think was that's you know, that's the the things that go behind these summits. But that is a very good thing. No, the the choreography is 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 detailed and very specific. Um, but I also appreciate, Ambassador, that you just said chilling. Um, that makes me happy. <laughs> the idea that President Biden would be chilling. It's one thirty at night here in Geneva. I think uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Ambassador Michael McFaul, thank you so much for taking the time out and helping us understand what to expect in this sure. very important meeting. Please stay safe. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.